Hi everyone, we have finished learning the visualization part of the course and before moving to the concurrency part we will do recapture about uh, what we have learned for visualization and we will do a little bit of preparation for quiz 2 after that. Let me announce uh, quiz 2. This Wednesday on November 9th uh, we will have quiz 2 and I will open quiz 2 from Wednesday uh, November 9th from 8.30 a.m. to Friday uh, 11 11 uh, November uh, 11th uh, 11 95 p.m. so midnight Friday so you can take the quiz anytime during the period you will have up to three tier trials and I will take the highest score so you can have an and you know, please try it as many as possible if you want to get a higher score and you can have a limited time during taking the quiz so there's a no time limit after you start the quiz uh, likewise, quiz one, we will have the same open material policy. So you may refer to lecture slides, videos, code, and textbook. However, you are not allowed to communicate with the others during taking the quiz. And make sure you can take the quiz up to three times. So please take the advantage of this policy. For example, if you got the score five over nine, then you can take it again to do, make a better score. Also. If you make a mistake uh, during the first trial, then you can use the second chance to recover the mistake. But there will be no more than three attempts, so please be extra careful for the th second and third attempts to not to make any kind of mistake. And around the end of the video, we will go over the uh, preparations for the quiz too. So uh, if you want to skip the reviewing, then, then just jump over that. And the topics for today is to review what we have learned for the virtualization part of the operating systems. In our textbook, uh, categorize parts of the operating systems into th three pieces. So the name of the textbook is Operating System, Three Easy Pieces, OSTEP. And those three pieces are virtualization, concurrency, and persistence. And we just finished learning about the virtualization, which is related to how an operating system manages virtual memory process and handling user kernel separation and handling interrupt and etc. So before moving to concurrency part, uh, which we will learn in week seven to week nine about like uh, multi-threading and synchronization scheduling, uh, we will do recap on the virtualization part for today. First, uh, let's start with what is an OS in a very high level. We use computers to run applications and computers have hardware resources that those applications want to utilize to finish their job. For example, applications would like to use CPU to execute their code, memory and disk to store their progress, and network device to communicate with the other systems. And an operating system sits in between applications and the hardware resources and provide an efficient abstraction to hardware resources to the application. And for managing hardware resources, we start with uh, managing systems memory. In JAWS Lab 1, we have seen that the systems with BIOS starts with the 16-bit mode. So we learned how 16-bit processor can access 20-bit address space, which is a one megabyte of memory using the real mode segmentation. It was segment register multiplied by 16 and add the offset. And because in this mode, we can only access one megabyte of memory, which is too small for this error. And then to use the full four gigabyte of the virtual memory space, we enabled a protected mode. And in the protected mode, the global descriptor table, GDT, defines a base and limit, and the segment register is used for selecting one of the entry in the G global descriptor table. 
and the addressing in the protected mode segmentation will be base plus offset if the offset is smaller than the limit. And the reason why we need to enable A20 in protected mode is because BIOS always runs CPU in 16-bit mode. BIOS regards our CPU as I8086, which is a 42-year-old old CPU for the backward compatibility. So even for the 64 machine, if we use BIOS as a startup firmware, then we need to take the same step from the switching from the real mode to protected mode for 32-bit and also enable long mode for the 64-bit Intel processors. However, modern machines do not use BIOS and kill some of the backward compatibility for those kind of the old devices. And the startup of the machine is replaced by UEFI for the most of the cases. And I'm sure that like some of you have heard about the, uh, your system is with UEFI. And that stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. And from the name, you can fill it, uh, you can regard it like uh, it's more advanced than extensible uh, BIOS. And with this UEFI, because it can support uh, just starting processor in 32-bit or 64-bit mode, so if an OS operating system assumes that the computer will be booting with UEFI, then they do not have to deal with this kind of thing and just start to running in the 64-bit uh, or 32-bit mode. And next is about virtual memory. Intel processor uses paging for implementing virtual memory uh, as the method for implementing virtual memory system. And if it is enabled, all memory address will be regarded as virtual addresses, and it will go through the translation layer, starting from the CR3 register to find the page directory, and access page directory entry to find the page table, and then access page table entry to find the physical page address. In doing that, we split the virtual address into two, the page number and offset, and we only translate the top 20 bits, the page number from virtual to physical, and that will be split into two again, page directory index for top 10 bits and the page table index for lower 10 bits. And to translate the address, the CPU will refer to the CR3 register to find the current page directory and use the page directory index to uh, get the address of the page table uh, from the page directory entry. And then it will find the corresponding page table. Then the CPU will use page table index from the virtual address to access the current corresponding page table entry. And then we get the physical page number. And finally, by attaching the offset, the lower 12 bits of the virtual address to this physical page number, we get the physical address. And if we express this kind of the process as macros in JAWS, then it will be something like this. And what it means, it first loads the CR3 register, and because it points to the physical address of the page directory, we translate it into kernel virtual address and set it as a page directory. And then we use the page directory index to index the page directory and uh, take out the address of the physical address of the page table and translate that to virtual and put it at, as a variable PT to point the page table. And then we use the page table index to index page table to get the page table entry and get the address part uh, using the PTADDR macro and put it on the PADDR by adding the offset. So this is 
So that is uh, somewhat uh, pseudocode in like a just representation of the this kind of the translation layer. But the, this translation will not be done by the software. Uh, we will use uh, these kind of thing to put the data uh, in like uh, the page directory and page table. But the translation it will be automatically done by the CPU. And and because this address translation uh, requires like uh, the two additional memory access, so this can be cached by TLB, the translation Lucaside buffer uh, to speed up this kind of the uh, address translation. And this diagram summarizes how memory address translation works in x86. It starts with the segmentation. So if, uh, if your address comes with the selector and offset format, uh, it should go through the segment translation. And it will look up the global descriptor table and find the base and add the offset to the base and translate that to the linear address. And in case of like a, you don't have like a segment offset format, but just having the address, but that in that case, that will be naturally a linear address. And after having the linear address, if paging is enabled, this linear address is a, just a virtual address. So segment translation do not translate the uh, uh, address to the physical address. It just generates the linear address, which is a virtual address. Then the CPU need to translate this uh, linear address to the physical address again. And this is done by, by walking down the page table uh, by referring to the CR3 register uh, using the page directory index, index the page directory, and get the address of the page table, and using the page table index, get the page table entry, and then get the physical address. Please make sure to know how to describe the, this conceptual diagram for the virtual memory uh, translation in x86. And then we have learned about three goals of virtual memory. I believe most of you know about this correctly as we go over some questions in quiz one. So basically, uh, virtual memory is something like uh, having one level of indirection uh, from the virtual address to the physical address uh, and having a, such an indirection give benefits to us, something like transparency. That means we can't let the application program use any kind of the virtual address uh, of their choice, regardless of the state of the system. For example, even if the one program has already loaded their program code and stack data, those kind of things, and to a specific virtual address, we can reuse those virtual address to load another program because these addresses are virtual and virtual addresses are private to each pro uh, process. And for efficiency, uh, we will not having memory fragmentation issue, for example, uh, even if you have free space of the 288 kilobyte of the physical memory, uh, but it's not contiguous at all, uh, scattered across many locations and physically, then we cannot load the program size, the 288 kilobyte, because a program requires like uh, some of the sequential allocation. We cannot load that into the physical memory because free spaces are scattered but we can load that in virtual address because we can create the virtually contiguous memory even if like a physical memory is a scattered uh, like this because we have this kind of the interaction table. And lastly, uh, regarding the protection, because we will assign separate the virtual memory space uh, to each process and now what you are doing in lab three was setting up a separated virtual memory space in the EMV set of VM function, right? 
uh, because modern operating systems are doing that, we can prevent accessing other programs and memory space from one program to the other. So there's a no virtual address to the point to the physical address part of like a, these kind of the other processes memory. So one program can enjoy their virtual memory space uh, without interference from the other programs. And then using this virtual memory, we can set memory permissions, read or write. And in addition to that, uh, we can also separate privilege level, kernel and user. In the operating systems uh, supporting x86 processor, they follow this kind of the ring privilege model, which put the privilege level ring zero, the most privileged and privileged level, uh, give that to the OS kernel. And with that privilege level, an operating system can configure systems, access hardware directly, manage other ring three processes, and serves as a trusted computing base because memory addresses marked without PTEU will be accessible only by kernel, so no application process can touch those parts. So we basically implemented this kind of the privilege separation using the permission flag in virtual memory. And then the user level application runs in ring three which is the restricted privilege level. In this level, applications cannot access kernel memory space, reserve the kernel, so address that is without set of the PTU yeah, in their page table entry, then ring three processes cannot access them. And because only the operating system uh, can set the uh, all hardware access, uh, requires a ring zero privilege, applications cannot talk directly to hardware. And to use them, it must send a request to the operating system, and that is the system call, and the operating system uh, checks, applies the security checks whenever a system call happens, and that's how operating system protects the system uh, from applications. And how an operating system switches execution from user to kernel and the kernel to user is as follows. An application may call a library call in link three, such as printf. Then the library call will call a system call, syswrite, to access the console the hardware. Then it will generate the software interrupt to switch the execution from user to kernel and the kernel handles the request, make a function call uh, to handle that. After that, kernel can run the instruction irit to return from the interrupt context to the context of the application, and the library function in the application returns to the original application context. This is how vertical context switch switching from user to kernel, kernel to user works. And switching from the user to kernel is done by system call, which is a software interrupt in JOS. And switching from kernel to user is done by IRIT. And then how a modern operating system can handle horizontal context switch, switching from an application, one application to the other. For this, we first learned about the cooperative multitasking, which requires an application yield their execution to let OS switch uh, the execution from one app to the other. So the application must yield the execution to the operating system voluntarily, and then OS then schedule the other application. However, this kind of approach suffers a problem. What will happen if a process runs this kind of an infinite loop? Then there will be no yield and loop will never end. 
So the other processor waits indefinitely, like this. And to avoid that, a modern operating system implants a horizontal context switch uh, with the design of the primitive multitasking uh, relying on the timer interrupt. And that is, after uh, one time quantum set by an operating system, for example, one millisecond, for example, the clock hardware uh, in the system will generate a timer interrupt. Then the CPU will the interrupt handler in the operating system, so the execution switches from the user application to the kernel because of the interrupt. And then the kernel select uh, which other application to run and run IRIT to schedule that. And this scheduled part is conceptually the same as the EMV run function in JAWS. And you know that it will call EMV pop TF and internally it will run IRIT. And this kind of the user kernel switch, uh, we learned about how we can implement the system call layer uh, via the call gate. And that is, application calls a library call, and the library call generates a software interrupt uh, to call a system call. And at the system call interrupt handling routine, uh, OS use that as a call gate and check if system call request is legitimate or not. And during the lecture, uh, we have we take a look at the example about like a, what will happen if a read system call uses a kernel address. Then it might overwrite a kernel code and data uh, by user level code. So the kernel must reject such a request. So and that kind of check happens in the interrupt handling routine for the system call as a call gate. And after passing the security check, the OS forwards a request. And this is how an operating system can protect the system call layer, not allowing calling arbitrary functions of the operating system, but just allow call specific functions, each of system calls, and also check the legitimacy of the like calling request. Uh, and we apply the checks at the gate of the system call, uh, which is in our interrupt handling routine for the system call. And this is shown as a user mem check, assert, uh, adding up the, those kind of thing, uh, those kind of code in your system call handling routine in JAWS Lab 3. And then we learned about interrupts and these interrupts are usually comes from hardware, except for software interrupt. So it is asynchronous. And what it means is that because interrupts comes from external hardware, something like uh, from the timer uh, interrupt from the external hardware clock, it is not synchronous to the execution of the CPU. It can happen any time of the execution. In the contrast, Software interrupts are asynchronous because it will be generated only if the CPU runs the int instruction. And when the interrupt occurs, the CPU will stop the current process and store the execution context as a trap frame. And then runs the kernel code by referring to IDT uh, based on the interrupt number, it will access the uh, interrupt description table and after and call the interrupt handling routine. And after handling the interrupt, the kernel resumes the application uh, by executing IRIT. And among uh, traps, uh, interrupt and exception, uh, we have a special exception called a fault. And faults are exceptions that an OS can recover and continue the application execution. 
And the example of this is a page fold. And we have taken a look at two mechanisms that the modern operating systems utilize a page fold handler to implement uh, those. And they are copy and write fork and swapping. For copy and write, suppose we are running the same program instance for multiple instances like this. In such a case, we do not need to have multiple copies of the same data of the program. If the data is the same, then we can share the existing copy to reduce the memory footprint. And to do that, we can set memory pages of the process as read only entirely and regardless of the original permission, we set it as read only and bulk back those virtual pages without allocating new page, just share the existing physical pages loaded from the disk. And then do the same thing whenever we execute, we execute another instance. However, when any of the program applies write access to originally writable access section of the memory, it will generate page fault because it's read-only. And because we know that the, that fault is a false fault, that is, the memory is originally writable, but we marked as a readable because uh, we want to share this content with the others. Then to resolve that, uh, in the page fault handler, uh, we can do copy and write as it's a name. Uh, if there is a write access, uh, we then we can break the sharing by creating a private copy of that, of that physical page and use it to back the virtual address of the pr process. Like this, Cop make a private copy on write and change the mapping. Then we will put the original permission, read write, yeah. because now the memory is not shared and it has a private copy. By doing this, we can reduce physical memory usage for the pages that does not require private copies, like those. And next is about memory swapping. Suppose you have eight gigabyte of memory memory, but asked to run the program that requires a 16 gigabyte of memory. And we can load and run the program in eight gigabyte memory system because the program does not require 16 gigabyte of data at the same time. So what we can do is we can put some unused data out, fill required data in to run the program that requires a bigger memory than available memory in the system. And that is stuffed as a memory swapping. And to swap out a memory page, uh, we can remove a physical page and store that to disk with the process ID and the virtual address to later to look up the page uh, with the unique ID. And then when the program accesses the virtual address, it will generate the page fold because it is not backed by any of the physical page. And then what we will do is we can look up the disk and if the corresponding uh, virtual page exists in the disk, uh, we load that uh, to the physical memory and then map it to that virtual address. And then by continuing the execution, now the user application can seamlessly read this loaded page that is swapped in. Note that this kind of the swap out, swap it, and also the copy and write works transparently to the application. That means application don't know 
if that is ever happening, and just seamlessly uh, work if it is recovered. Next, we will go over quiz two preparation. Uh, make sure to take the quiz uh, on this Thursday or Friday before Friday, uh, 11, 59 p.m. And you will have two attempts and we will have open material policy. And the coverage for quiz two includes just lab two and three. So the virtual memory and user kernel system call interrupt handling and the lecture 8, 9, 10, 11. So it will include some part of the virtual memory thing from lab two. And mostly we will handle user kernel switch, interrupt handling, system calls, and page fault. So please study these materials thoroughly to prepare about the quiz or at least refer to the code and slide and videos for those parts before or while you are taking the quiz. And let's go over some questions that will make you feel more confident, confident about quiz too. And let's start with uh, some virtual memory protection questions in lab two. How an operating system or a C and CPU applies access control to virtual memory system. And the answer is, it's through setting memory permissions in the segmented data privilege level DPL or page directory in page table in, uh, uh, entries, we can set permission prolapse such as PTEW and PTEU. And these will be enforced uh, whenever CPU accesses the address. So that's how we can uh, apply the access control to the memory. Next, how an operating system kernel protect itself against attacks from application? And the answer is, this is by using uh, memory permission bits in page directory or page table entries and removing PTU will remove access from the user applications so the operating system kernel can make the memory space for storing kernel and important data uh, by removing uh, uh, with the removed uh, permission for the user space. Then the access is only allowed to ring zero. Then there is no way that the user ring three can access the, that part of the memory. Next. How an operating system protects a memory area as supposed to be read-only from write attempts? This is easy, and it is also by controlling memory permission flags in the PDE and PTE. And by removing PTEW, uh, we can make a memory pages read-only. And next, how an operating system isolates the memory space of a process from others. This is related to the protection goal of the virtual memory. By having a separated uh, page directory and page tables, we can give an isolated memory virtual memory space to each process. So this is done by, by having a new page directory and table for the new process. And next is about some calculation example about the memory over the calculation. Suppose we have the following virtual address mapping for the program. Text, data, VSS for these kind of the virtual addresses with these sites. In this case, can you come up with the required physical memory for supporting uh, this kind of the address translation. In other words, can you calculate the minimum required physical memory to support the page directory and page table entries for enabling this kind of mapping? To solve this, we need to think about how many page tables uh, do we need to enable these mappings. And let's start with page directory. Because each process must have a separated page directory 
So at least we need to use one page to store page directory entries like this. And for each entry, we need to analyze if the current mapping requires a page table or not. And because each uh, page directory entry will be responsible for mapping four megabyte of region, starting from zero to four megabyte, we do not have any of the starting address, so we don't need the page table. And same thing for the four megabyte to the eight megabyte, we do not have any of the starting address. So this range is uh, exclusive for the, the end. But for the from the like eight megabyte to the 12 megabyte space, uh, we have allocations of the text from like eight megabyte data from nine megabyte. So we definitely need the page table for this entry. And for the like next uh, 12 megabyte to the 16 megabyte, we have an allocation from the 12 to 13 megabyte space for BSS area. So we definitely need a page table entry. And for the other mappings, we do not have any, so don't need the page table. Then we need one page for page directory and two page tables. So we need three pages, total 12 kilobytes. So the overhead for supporting the mem uh, virtual to physical address translation and this kind of mapping uh, for uh, uh, for like uh, the supporting that with the page table and page directory, uh, we need 12 kilobyte of memory overhead. And next the question is about the user kernel switch. How modern operating system can get back the CPU execution from user application, uh, even if they are running in uh, infinite loop? And the answer is, by having a clock and relying on timer interrupt, we can implement primitive multitasking to support the time sharing execution on the CPU uh, by the operating system. And how a user program in Wing 3 accesses the hardware and what OS does for this? And to answer this question, uh, you can think about the system call. So operating system offers system call, uh, which is uh, APIs of the operating system to the application. And user application can interact uh, with the hardware only with those uh, system calls. And to do that, it generates a software interrupt uh, to switch the kernel execution. And at the call gate, uh, while handling the system call software interrupt, operating system check if the system call request is legitimate or not. And if it is legitimate, then OS executes kernel functions to access hardware and return the result to the user application. And next question is about trap frame. For an interrupt handling, uh, handling an interrupt with an error code, uh, we will have a trap frame. And for the trap frame, which part of the trap frame is prepared by CPU and which other part are prepared by the operating system? For example, your JAWS. Answering to this question will be easy when you get to the point of having this diagram. And if you can recall this diagram in the lab three description web page, then this is the part of the registers stored by CPU for the trap frame. So SS, ESP, EFLAX, CS, EIP, and the error code. These are prepared by the CPU. So SS, ESP, EFLAX, CS, and EIP, and error code. 
and the rest of part, tram number, DS, ES, and general purpose registers, these are stored by operating system. So in JAWS, uh, the trap handler puts a tram number and all traps function that you wrote during RAP3 and will store DS, ES, and all general purpose registers. Finally, about page fault. When we learn 1 million instances of the bin bash in our OS2 server running Linux enabled with copy and write fork scheme, yeah, then how many copies of the code for the read-only part of the bin bash exist in the physical memory? And if you can recall the copy and write scheme, the answer for this is very simple. There will be only one copy because kernel will share those pages across all the same process uh, program instances via copy and write. And the question says about the read-only pages, read-only, yeah, read-only pages. And these will never have le legitimate write, so there will be no legitimate copy on write. So there will be no copy. So it will have only one copy of that read-only memory page in the system, and that will be shared across entire 1 million processes. So the systems, are, the current systems are very efficient. And next, how an operating system can run a program that requires more memory than a machine's physical memory, uh, machine's available physical memory. And this question is about asking about memory swapping. And to do that, uh, we may store currently unused physical pages to disk as swap out. And accessing swap out pages by the program will generate a page fault. And then the operating system can handle this by looking up the fault address in the disk. And if it exists, and then the OS will swap in. Then continuing the execution will let the user application run seamlessly because the, when the application resumes the execution, now the virtual address is backed by the physical page, so it will work. So these will be like a, some of the simple questions in the, in the quiz. I will ask you for the, some different questions, but uh, you can easily find, figure out the answer if you study thoroughly about the recent uh, lectures, lecture 8, 9, 10, 11. And also, uh, if you are familiar with the answers in the questions in lab 2 and lab 3. This is the end of the lecture for today and hope you can finish uh, lab three on time and good luck to quest two.